Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Test Route channel. It has been a while since I've done a Steampunk video, so I figured it was about time I did one. I have been thinking about several things, but I remembered how much fun I had doing the one about YA, that is young adult fiction, in Steampunk. So I thought instead of doing my standard review, I would do something themed like that, something talking about steampunk in general, about certain of its characteristics. And the problem was coming up with something. I mean, I wanted it to be something that would not be a big joke. And there I had it, humor in steampunk. You would think that humor in steampunk would be a pretty easy call. I mean, it is a kind of preposterous notion. I mean, consider it. Consider the cosplay. And I do the cosplay, as you can see, obviously. But it is kind of silly. What we do is we take gears and we slap them on things. We glue them to things. And we have our hats and our goggles and our Victorian era type garb. And we make devices, gadgets, and weapons and false limbs out of PVC or wood or cardboard or whatever, and we paint them uh, gold or brass so that they look like metal. And so it's all very fake, but all very fun. There's a video that Key and Peel did about this a few years back. I'll put that link in the description if I think about it, and because it kind of exemplifies what I'm talking about. Yet this is part of its charm. This is part of the charm of the steampunk uh, cosplay community. As for the genre, it takes itself rather seriously. <laughs> it's, it's a different matter. It's, it's kind of funny. I think that's in the origin of the word punk, as in punk rock. Because that appeared in the 70s as this reaction against you know, hippie niceness. And so they were dressing weird. They were behaving weird. They were insulting the audience. And they were taking themselves dead serious. <laughs> Otherwise, people would have laughed at them, you know, having hair sticking up like this. So for with, with very few exceptions, uh, punk rock was a very serious thing, you know, about grim topics. The Ramones were an exception, and that's one of the reasons I love the Ramones. They were great. <laughs> they had fun with it. They really did. From there, we move on to cyberpunk, which was basically derived from that idea, from that punk idea, and they took a futuristic notion that was not optimistic, but pessimistic, dystopian, dark, the end of humanity, computers taking over the world, that sort of thing. So even though in places it was silly, <laughs> in places it was very silly, you know, people melding themselves to robots and so on, and uh, crazy, crazy get-ups and implausible future worlds, Nonetheless, they were very serious. Now, when Jeter, K.W. Jeter, invented the term steampunk, he was a cyberpunk author who wanted to do stuff about the Victorian era and have it a similar gritty, di pessimistic, dystopian feel. And so that also was meant to be serious. And when a lot of us later on in the big boom in the 21st century were writing more along the classic Victorian style of Hero heroism and optimism and so on, good and evil and so on, some of the original steampunk writers thought that was appalling. They wanted it to be about dystopia, about trashing the Victorian era. Well, we saw a more nuanced view. For example, in the uh, intro to uh, the Vandermeer's steampunk collection, they kind of bemoan that. <laughs> they think steampunk should be political. And by in Implication, I think they mean it should be left-leaning political. <laughs> but in any case, even some of the more optimistic steampunk that we wrote kind of took itself rather seriously. So in the recent video I did about YA and steampunk, I talked about the concept of whimsy, which means basically fun, you know, childlike fun. And whimsy is not necessarily funny. It is kind of charming, kind of naive, kind of sometimes silly, but it shouldn't necessarily make you laugh. An example was the Philip Reeves Mortal Engine series. 
It is a crazy idea about giant mobile cities, steam-powered cities rolling around on tank treads attacking each other. And it is crazy, and it's fun, but it's not necessarily funny. Only a few spots did I actually chuckle when I went through that whole series. And it, as it turns out, there is very little in steampunk that's explicitly comedy. <laughs> it was surprised me to think about that. Maybe that's because applying humor to a premise that is inherently pretty preposterous is like gilding the lily. <laughs> Not only that, but comedy is hard to write. I have experiences of my own to, to relate very briefly. Mrs. Desperado and I were at one time in a playwrights group locally here in Phoenix. And we were writing a bit about uh, a musical comedy adaptation of online dating. And actually, it was a lot of fun. And the, the director loved our stuff. We staged four of our scenes. And the humor was the hard part. I mean, my jokes always fell flat, whereas Mrs. Desperado's jokes were the ones that were funny. So I was pretty much contented myself with writing the music and the lyrics, which was the easier thing to do. So with that digression aside, uh, as I think Steve Martin said, comedy is hard. <laughs> uh, I set out to make some normal steampunk fiction that wasn't necessarily comedic because that's what I was into. So doing this video, looking for steampunk comedy, I was kind of scratching my head. There really isn't that much out there. There's some great comic historical fiction, for example, the Flashman series. He's an anti-hero, he's a scoundrel, but he gets himself into some really hilarious scrapes. But it's not really steampunk because they don't really alter history, other than the fact that he's in everything. <laughs> you know, he's at the Battle of the Little Bighorn and everything. But as far as actual steampunk humor, not an easy find. In fact, it was tough to find out enough novels to fill out a top 10. I was tempted to throw in TV shows like Briscoe County Jr., which is explicitly a steampunk western comedy that was made in the early 1990s. But no, I didn't have to, thankfully. Even though I love Briscoe County Jr. So without further ado, here we have the top 10 historical steampunk novels. Starting with number 10, Pimp My Airship by Maurice Broadus. Now Maurice Broadus is an African-American author who's done a lot of black themed things. And one of his books was, for example, Kingmaker, which is a retelling of the King Arthur legend in the context of modern gang warfare. At least that's what I think it's about. I have a copy of it, haven't read it yet. But this one I had to read right away when I saw it. Pimp My Airship, what a cool title. In fact, he mentioned somewhere that he thought of the title and he thought, I have to write this. This is pretty funny. And this is rough satirical. It takes place in a dystopian steampunk Indianapolis. You don't see Indianapolis in anything steampunk. And the hero is a pothead poet named Sleepy. Appropriate name for a pothead. <laughs> and he has to try to head off this conspiracy by the rulers of Indianapolis. And it involves the airship. Unfortunately, not enough for my taste, but it does kind of kind of fill out that rather satirical notion. So in that sense, it's funny. The next two novels are by some of the luminaries of the early steampunk movement, and they are darkly comedic in the sense that they're going back to the Victorian era and doing some rather bizarre things that happen to be funny. Number nine is K.W. Jeter's Infernal Devices. I have reviewed his George Dower series. This is the first one. The second two I didn't find to be very funny. They got too dark for my taste. Uh, and this one, though, kind of strikes a good balance. George Dower is an incompetent clock repairman. He inherited his father's business. And he gets into all these weird situations with strange societies and bizarre and mutant people like fish people in suburban London, <laughs> and, you know, there's plots to destroy the world, and it is pretty funny, and it's even resolved in a funny way. Number eight is James Blaylock's Homunculus. Now, James Blaylock is a friend of Jeter, and they participated in a lot of this early 
Steampunk Founding. Now this book, Homunculus, is the first in the Narbondo series. Narbondo is a villain. He's a evil hunchback. <clears throat> as much of a trope as that is. <laughs> and which is funny in itself. The hero, who also bears the name of some of the series, is Langdon St. Ives. Kind of this heroic Englishman. Very Stalin. Very, very uh, staunch. So this first one is the funniest and it involves a lot of crazy misfit characters. There is the Trismegistus Club, which is a bunch of, you know, wannabe scientists and inventors. Uh, a lot of them are losers, drunkards and whatnot, but they have to try to save England from a menace. And there's these outlandish villains. And some of the heroes are rather foppish, you know, rather, rather pretentious. There's this butler who reminds me of Jeeves in that series, that particular uh, Wodehouse series, who is pretty cool. And I imagine he was intentionally modeled after Jeeves. Number seven. We're going to go to Japan for this one. Clockwork Planet by Yu Kamiya and Tsubaki Himana. I believe I mentioned this in my steampunk anime video. And this is a bizarre one. This is the most bizarre premise you can imagine. And there is a light novel version, so I can include it in my list of novels. In this story... The Earth has been destroyed and rebuilt in clockwork. Yes, <laughs> it's that weird. And the hero is that young, nerdy clock repairman, of course, who is kind of a, you know, outcast and a loser. But he meets this beautiful, young-looking female android <laughs> who is this cute anime girl, but also very dangerous. You know, she's got these sharp knives in, in, concealed in her body. And he falls in love with her and wants to marry her, <laughs> of course. And there's all these bizarre other characters, including a like a 12-year-old genius girl. And there's a lot of odd, inappropriate sexual humor. <laughs> and uh, it is funny. you got to say it's funny. Number six, the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences series by Pip Ballantyne and T. Morris. Now, I have talked about this before. I've raved about it in my Steampunk series video because it's my number one favorite. It stars the government agents Eliza Braun and Wellington Books. And they work for the Ministry, which is a British Empire thing. It's kind of an equivalent, a 19th century equivalent of the X-Files. They investigate odd and unexplained phenomena. And it's kind of funny uh, in a lot of it because they have this banter going back and forth. <laughs> you know, they're kind of the odd couple and they have all this sexual tension. And that's funny, but there's also this character called Bruce Campbell, who's this Australian kind of buffoon, and he's a narcissist, he's a ladies' man, and uh, sometimes he gets beat up by the women he's hitting on. So, you know, that's some pretty funny stuff with Bruce in it, especially because his name is Bruce, if you remember the Monty Python sketch. Number five, Mark Twain on the Moon by Michael Shulkins. And this is a trilogy. I don't remember the names of the three books. They're, they're kind of packaged together. So you can look them up in that fashion, although they will list the three books. And this involves the famous Sam Clemens going prospecting on the moon. Yes. <laughs> and it's plausible, you know, Victorian tech. They don't imagine that they are fired out of a gun and they don't imagine that the moon has air. It's a lot more realistic. And in this case, he goes with his best friend. Uh, to work in a lunar mine and has all these weird adventures and problems and issues. And the author does very good at um, mimicking Mr. Clemens' style, but it's not quite as funny as the original, as the original Mark Twain. Still, it's pretty good, and it is funny, so it classifies as a comedy. Number four, The Steampunk Trilogy by Paul D. Filippo. Now, this is not an actual trilogy. It's a single book comprised of three novellas, which I will briefly describe in increasing comedic order. Number three, Walt and Emily, which is about a fictional affair between Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson, which is kind of ludicrous in the sense that they were both gay, or at least Emily Dickinson was reputed to be gay. And uh, so it's funny in that aspect. Number two, Hot and Tots. 
This is about the real life biologist, historical biologist, Louis Agassiz, who is a very groundbreaking scientist, but he's been canceled because of his some of his views on race, which is unfortunate. I think he was sincere. I don't think he was a hater. But nonetheless, this story really lampoons him, shows him as a raving racist who happens to become sexually obsessed with this big booty African woman. <laughs> so it's very bawdy, as all of the Philippos humor is. Finally, number one, and I did really like this one, uh, Victoria, in which Queen Victoria disappears. She's tired of being queen. And uh, so, of course, the government has to replace her if they're in a panic. But they replace her with a newt. <laughs> yes, a biologically engineered newt that looks like a woman uh, that can uh, walk and act regal, but she can't talk. And she has this weird sex drive where she has to be serviced by numerous male human companions, <laughs> which makes it very funny and silly and kind of body too, of course. Number three, Zeppelin's West by Joe Lansdale. I've talked about him before. I've talked about this book before. It's a pretty cool book. And the funny thing is that Lansdale's written some stuff that I hated, a particular story in Anne and Jeff Vandermeer's Steampunk Compendium, in which it's a horror thing that went too far, too gross for my taste. This book, however, strikes a good balance. It is kind of gross, it is kind of crude, but it's funny. And this has the Wild West show, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. They have a Zeppelin, and they travel to Japan, and things go rather wrong. <laughs> so they have to run for their lives. They crash on this deserted island, which happens to be inhabited by Dr. Moreau and his creatures, his monstrous creatures. And now, they don't call him that. I think it's Dr. Bobo. <laughs> and he's a rather disgusting character. Like, he picks his nose and stuff all the time. But I think it may be copyright issues. But anyway, we meet Frankenstein, who is gay. <laughs> the monster that is, and we meet, you know, Dracula and all sorts of, you know, legendary fictional villains and monsters. And my favorite character in here was Sitting Bull, who was this completely horny old dude, <laughs> a dirty old man who would hit on anything with a skirt or out of a skirt. Uh, so it was pretty funny. There's a sequel called Flaming London, which is hard to find. Uh, I guess it's like at least $30 to get a hard copy of this, and I have put this on my Christmas list. Number two, the Girl Genius series by Phil and Kaya Folio. This is originally a graphic novel written by these two, this couple, and they have a very funny character called Agatha Hetrodyne. She's this bright, fun, naive, cute little blonde in this world overrun by mad scientists. They are called sparks, and they, this genius often drives them crazy, and they cause all sorts of trouble, which means the public hates them. Now, she is a spark, too, but not mad, or at least not yet. <laughs> and she invents all these cute little robots she calls clanks, and she keeps getting abducted and, and, and threatened by all these evil characters, including this emperor king, I forget his exact name, that rules Europe at this time. I think he's kind of a Napoleon stand-in, but he sounds a little bit more German. And so it's it's a lot of fun. Now, there is a prose version of it, which is why it qualifies for this list. I am not too crazy about it because the writing style, there's some problems that just kind of irritate me. <laughs> Overuse of certain words and phrases, for example. And nonetheless, you may like it. I mean, it is a funny series. It is It is some funny stories. So it definitely goes on this list. Now, number one. Number one is a book I was not aware of until very recently. It is called Shroud of the Thwacker by Chris Elliott and is only available in paper. It is that same Chris Elliott, the comic from SNL, uh, the 1994 film Cabin Boy, and the 1990s sitcom Get a Life. As I said, it's only available in paper, and it's Paperback version is like under $2, which means it's probably going out of print. That's unfortunate. Get a copy while you can. This is a very silly book. It's hilariously, relentlessly silly. And it had me laughing out loud many times. It's kind of Python-esque in, in that way. It's about a fictional serial killer 
called Jack the Jolly Thwacker, who is New York's answer to Jack the Ripper. But instead of ripping his victims, he thwacks them over the head. And then he mutilates their bodies in horrible, disgusting ways. <laughs> and it has the anachronistic tech that steampunk has to have, such as kerosene-powered cell phones. <laughs> Here, let me, let me fuel up my cell phone so I can call headquarters. The protagonists are the New York City police chief, his former girlfriend, uh, who is a suffragette reporter and kind of a thorn in his side now, and the mayor, Theodore Roosevelt. Yes, the guy who became president later. And he's one of my favorite presidents. And this book rather lampoons him, shows him as a, it's kind of an eccentric buffoon. <laughs> and he's got this love for food because Teddy was kind of a chubby fellow. And so he's obsessed with food. And he has this mansion that's full of exotic creatures, including a Native American that has to live in a cage. <laughs> and this poor guy, he spends his days reading through Teddy's library. He speaks with an Oxford accent, and he corrects Teddy's grammar, things like that. So it's a pretty pretty book, very, very silly. And, you know, a lot of the humor is, if you, as, if you know Chris Elliott at all, as you'd expect, it's puns, potty humor, uh, fart jokes, <laughs> a lot of grotesquerie involving the murders. It did make me laugh out loud on many occasions. So I do definitely recommend this as an example of steampunk humor, if you don't mind a little bit of, again, gross humor. In summary, whereas steampunk is well known for its preeminence in YA fiction, that is young adult, it is not well known for humor. And I had to have a lot of perseverance to find a list of 10. <laughs> At least that's the way I see it. I mean, there's like, there's like subtle humor in a lot of things, but as far as explicit comedy, not much. It's ironic because steampunk is kind of a tongue-in-cheek genre, uh, often satirical, often kind of preposterous, that takes itself rather too seriously at times. Nothing wrong with that. I, it is what it is, and I still love steampunk, obviously. Please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Please give me suggestions for other shows that I may very well do. Please like and subscribe, which helps us get out the good steampunk word, pro promote this genre, and other works of science fiction and fantasy that are sometimes not well known that I do want to promote. Please check out my books. I have a list of links to my Amazon page and so on. You can buy them in paper form or an ebook. One of these days I will have audiobooks. Very soon, I hope. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying Idos Amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.